Good morning. I was going to introduce the young man <clears throat> to my left, but he's not there. He's sitting right in front. Jay Lair. That's L E H R. He is currently the senior policy analyst for ICSC, the International Climate Science Coalition, where he works closely with Tom Harris, the executive director of ICSC. Jay and Tom write editorials, produce podcasts, and make presentations to various groups interested in climate-related issues, spreading the inconvenient truth about the greatest deception in history that has spread like a virus around the world. Jay shares attributes common to many other scientists in this room. <clears throat> Jay is an environmentalist at heart, like so many of us. He's also an athlete, a scientist, and an educator. Jay hails from a small town I found out in New Jersey, which uh, I was visualizing as Mayberry from the 60s, but I don't know really what it was like. Somehow, Jay managed to gain acceptance to Princeton University, where he earned a degree in geological engineering <clears throat> at age 20. Shortly thereafter, Jay earned the first PhD ever granted by the University of Arizona in groundwater hydrology. I have no idea of the significance of receiving the first PhD in that field from that university, but it's always in the resume, so I'm including it. As an environmentalist, Jay served as president of the Sierra Club in California long before it became radicalized. He helped form the Environmental Protection Agency during the Nixon era, when the EPA really was needed to clean up our air and water and long before the EPA joined the deep state and started practicing political science instead of real science. As Alan Carlin can tell you, Alan. Uh, Jay's an athlete. He's a cyclist, a scuba diver, a marathon runner, skydiver. In fact, he holds the world's record for sequential monthly skydives, encompassing 34 years and 11 months which came to an abrupt halt <laughs> when he fell off his bicycle and broke his leg. <laughs> Jay tried to convince his doctor it was okay to skydive with a broken leg. <laughs> he didn't win that one. Jay became a recognized expert in energy matters, hydrology issues, climatology, and many related areas. He has testified before Congress many times, spoken on scientific issues across the nation and around the world. He's written 36 books, authored more than 1,000 magazine and journal, journal articles. He's written too many editorials to count. And he'll participate in any form of communication to educate others about scientific matters. He also knows a lot about coral reef ecology something that is a special interest of mine, and just about any subject that's likely to come up in a scientific uh, discussion. I, I once asked Jay how he knew so much about so many subjects, and he said, I read five hours every day. So now we know. He doesn't sleep. Jay is really a scientist, science educator. He is what I call a transfer thinker which explains his ability to apply his intellect to almost any subject. He looks at the big picture, simplifies it to the level of common sense, and relates it to ordinary people of any disposition. He carries a business card with the 10 most important things about global warming and climate change written on the back of the card. His expertise is really in communication of science to others. Jay sticks to the scientific method, and just tells the truth, however in inconvenient that might be. Jay served as the science director at the Heartland Institute for 26 years, focusing much of his time in energy exposing man-made global warming, climate change fraud. It's now my pleasure and honor to present Jay with the coveted Dauntless Purveyor of Climate Truth Award from the Heartland Institute. Jay.
Thank you, Harley. Wow. J Jay Lair, 2019 Dauntless Purveyor of Climate Truth Award, presented by the Heartland Institute. It's beautiful. Thank you, Harley. Thank you, all of you. Uh, when you're as outspoken as I, uh, you really don't get awards. You get a lot of hate mail. So this, this is a uh, unique opportunity for me. Uh, indeed, science education has been my uh, life's work. I've got to thank uh, Joe Bast, who ran the Heartland for 34 years, of uh, giving me the opportunity. Yes. Uh, Joe uh, couldn't be here, but I got to tell you, I was with Joe last weekend at a meeting in Tucson, Arizona, and uh, he and Diane have never looked healthier, have never been happier, uh, are enjoying uh, a little bit of retirement. So my wife Janet and I had a wonderful uh, weekend with them, and I know you'd uh, be happy to know that. Uh, my uh, science education career uh, began basically working, uh, creating EPA. Uh, from 1968 to 1971, uh, myself and a half a dozen other people uh, worked to successfully convince Richard Nixon to form a uh, environmental protection agency. Uh, I testified before various committees of the Congress and the Senate uh, uh, two dozen times uh, before winning that battle. And in the next uh, 10 years, uh, we passed a safety net of seven pieces of legislation to protect our environment. Uh, for the last uh, 30 years, I've been working to dismantle EPA. <clears throat> um, I, I did not succeed. I'm now uh, working to move it out of uh, Washington. And there is hope there. <clears throat> My friend, uh, Sonny Perdue, who's the Secretary of Agriculture, is trying to uh, move the U.S. Department of Agriculture out of Washington. Uh, the head of HUD is trying to move uh, HUD to Detroit. Uh, if we could get more agencies out of the swamp, uh, the deep state would lose uh, much of its effectiveness. <clears throat> uh, following work on, uh, with EPA, uh, I did a lot of work on uh, nuclear energy. In, uh, on March 11th, 2011, the tsunami hit Fukushima just as I had completed uh, a book on, uh, actually, an encyclopedia of nuclear energy. And uh, CNN found me an hour after the tsunami and asked me if I would come to their studio and talk about the, the impact. Uh, I had no idea there had been a tsunami but I had an hour drive to get to their studio, and by the time I got there, I had uh, t contacted every nuclear expert I knew in the country uh, to ensure that what I knew would happen uh, would happen, and what I knew would happen is that there would be no radiation poisoning, uh, there would be no deaths because of, there just wasn't enough radiation that could escape and last uh, long enough. Uh, the people at CNN were in a state of shock, uh, 23 Network TV shows uh, followed uh, for me, uh, all of which I explained what, of course, uh, turned out to be true. But for three full years, I got hate mail and, and death threats. Uh, paddling uphill scientifically is very uh, difficult. Now, essentially, all of my work uh, is dealing with the climate collusion, the climate delusion, all of which uh, you have heard about in the, the last really brilliant hour, uh, the films we saw from the CO2 Coalition and from Craig Rucker and C-Factor are just uh, amazing. Uh, clearly, it's insane to think that uh, carbon dioxide is a problem. Uh, it is wonderful. It's at 410 now. Uh, I hope I live long enough to see it go to 800 and see uh, <laughs> <clears throat> more, more and more CO2 uh, in, the, in the atmosphere. Uh, what they're trying to do, of course, is to destroy our, our way of life. And uh, they're, they're succeeding. Uh, we have got to, uh, we've got to stop them. I'm going to put on a slide right now <clears throat> that shows uh, 12 variables. I, I, what I'm going to tell you in the next few minutes are common sense things 
that I think will uh, help us win this war. I talked with uh, Willie Soon, who's in San Francisco today, couldn't be here. Tom Weissmuller, one of the NASA people that uh, landed Neil Armstrong on the moon, uh, about what were uh, a dozen major variables that anybody with an IQ above plant life would uh, realize would be required to put in a mathematical equation to simulate how the Earth works. Uh, as you read these 12, your mind should be saying, well, of course, we need to know these. We don't. These are 12 variables that we have a little information on, but not much. We need to be explaining this to the public because all they have <clears throat> are absurd mathematical models. Joe Bastardi will be our banquet speaker tonight, and I'm sure he will support the fact that our seven-day weather forecast is only accurate 56% of the time, though I know Joe, and he's probably the best weather guy in the country, and his record is probably uh, better than 56%. We can uh, hear him say that tonight, but they're trying to predict our, the temperature of the planet out uh, 10 years, uh, 50 years, and a century. It's, uh, it's totally insanity, and that's what uh, we've got to remove from the minds of the public. Now, uh, a lot of you know, well, actually, Harley just mentioned that I was a skydiver. Uh, Christopher Moncton, Lord Christopher Moncton, and I are, are both skydivers. Most of you are aware of that. Uh, I have 1,500 more uh, jumps than uh, Christopher has. Uh, he has not uh, jumped in a few years. Uh, I haven't jumped in a few weeks. Uh, but uh, Christopher's jump into Durban, South Africa for the Conference of Parties 17, probably more important than uh, any of my 1,500 jumps. But every June, I am fortunate enough to get to rehearse with a team of skydivers who reenact the Normandy invasion every June. And uh, they jump at my jump center because uh, we let them jump out at 1,200 feet. <clears throat> in Normandy, they actually jumped at 500 feet, but in the reenactment, they jump from 1,200. Uh, the FAA does not allow you to jump uh, out below uh, 2,500 uh, feet, but my jump center, uh, which uh, is uh, kind of a renegade from FAA, lets them jump lower. In order to keep my record of 34 years and 1,100 uh, months, actually, I've made a few jumps at 1,000 feet. But when we're rehearsing the Normandy jump, we think about what it was like for the paratroopers to exit planes from 500 feet with enemy fire. Uh, they all risked their lives to save the world from uh, Nazi and, and Hitler. Everybody in this room is not risking their lives, but we are all risking our way of life because that's what this is all about. It's not about climate change. It's not about carbon dioxide. It's about our way of life. And we have failed to properly educate politicians, students, and the public. I'm going to tell you something that's probably a little bit shocking. In 2013, the student body of Harvard voted to remove $500 million of investment from anything to do with fossil fuels. In 2014, the female president of Harvard announced that the Harvard Endowment was going to spend $400 million fighting climate change. Now, you would think people as intelligent as those at Harvard would know this is not about science. It's not about climate. It's about socialism versus capitalism. The Russian collusion has now gone down in flames. 
It's the climate delusion, the climate collusion that we are, we're now fighting. And the message I want to bring to you, and I may offend some of you, is that we have got to stop battling their numbers with our numbers. And a lot of you here are doing that. There's only one number that matters, and I just will ask this as a question, not rhetorically. Someone would, in the audience would tell me, what is the only number that matters in this fight? You're too shy. The number is zero. Zero. That's the impact of man's carbon dioxide emissions to the thermostat of the planet. And I like to use the word thermostat because everyone has them. So I don't talk temperature anymore. I talk controlling the thermostat of the planet. They are trying to send us back 100 years by eliminating fossil fuels. Only things will be worse by far than they were 100 years ago because they will have installed a government that controls every element of our lives. So I want to present to you something that is in your packets that I think would be helpful to you in convincing just plain folks that the idea that man caused carbon dioxide has anything to do with the planet's temperature. So I'm going to show you two slides. The first one, and these slides were, uh, the impetus for these slides were from a very dear friend of mine, Sam Horowitz, that prodded me for years to tell the simple story. And we've done it through a, a picture that has 10,000 dots on it. And your new president, Frank Lassay, alluded to it this morning when he mentioned four dots. This one is a little different. This has 10,000 dots, each one representing greenhouse gases. And the green dots are all water vapor. The yellow is methane. The black is carbon dioxide. But the 12 dots in the bottom right corner are all of the carbon dioxide greenhouse gas that we contribute. In the next slide, it shows 10,000 dots representing all the gases in the atmosphere. You all learned in high school that 7,800 of those dots are nitrogen, 2,100 are oxygen, 90 are argon, four dots, four thousandths of the atmosphere, 400 parts per million, is carbon dioxide, and only one of those dots is what we contribute. How is it conceivably possible that this tiny amount of a gas can control the thermostat of our planet? It can't. I was extremely thrilled when I sent the two graphs to Joe Bastardi, and he loved them and has used them in some of his publications. Those two are in your packets. If you uh, email me or Heartland, we'll send you the electronic versions of them. And there's one other diagram in your packet, which NASA put out, and it's the greening of the planet. And uh, as you all know, that Africa is 24% greener than it was 40 years ago. Everything about carbon dioxide is good. So I leave you just with the idea that you have to present the message to everybody you talk to. There is nobody that rides an elevator with me or sits next to me on an airplane or, or uh, yes, yes, yeah. Or my favorite one, my favorite one is shopping for dog food uh, in the supermarket. If someone's taking a little while picking out their dog food, they're gonna get a tutorial on uh, climate change and appeal to the simplicity of it. That's why we created these diagrams. Uh, that's why I say 
while you are doing some work and you may calculate that there may be something to do with carbon dioxide and the temperature of the planet, uh, the default number, the only number that really makes any sense, is zero. And I think that's what we have to uh, convey, and I hope you'll all do it. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> she wants you back. <laughs>